We're going to continue our study of physics by talking about a field called statics and something called torque. So statics, we already know what this is. This is the study of forces in equilibrium. And we've studied this in terms of things acting in lines, in, in terms of linear motion. So in linear terms, statics uh, is, is studying motion, studying forces in equilibrium. So when the external forces acting in a line are equal to zero, that's when you have uh, static forces, um, when you're doing a field of statics. So when Newton's second law gives you uh, sum of forces external uh, equal to zero, so you have no external accelerations, that's the field of statics. We have the same thing in linear and rotational motion too, but in rotational motion, we can't use the typical linear force that we're used to. In rotational motion, we need to define a new kind of uh, rotational force, basically. This new kind of rotational force is something called torque. So that's tau, and it's defined to be a radius times the linear force that we're used to times the sine of some angle. So let's draw a picture of what this looks like to get an idea of what rotational force is. And we're going to do this in terms of a door. So we know a door rotates around a hinge. So there's my hinge, and here's my door. When I open a door, I apply a force. So I apply a force, maybe I push on this door, so the force that I push with uh, is going to be this force right here. I apply a force, a linear force, just pushing the doorknob, uh, kind of pushing this, this door down. And I'm applying that force at a specific distance away from the pivot point. And that distance away from the pivot point is r. That's my radius. And my theta, my angle, is the angle between my radius, which kind of comes out to this force, and the direction that the force is acting. So in this case, we can see it's a 90 degree angle. So that's basically what torque is. Tau is the torque. R is the radius. So that's the distance from your pivot point to wherever you're applying the force. F is the force that you apply to cause the rotation. And theta is going to be the angle between your radius r and the force that you actually apply. So we can figure out what the units of torque are as well. The units of torque are going to be the units of r times the units of f times the units of uh, sine of theta. So the units of r are meters in the SI system, and the units of force are going to be newtons. And the sine of uh, theta is unitless, so the units of torque are newtons times meters. And if we're going to study this torque in terms of statics, we need to understand that, uh, that the external forces are not going to be equal to zero. Now, in statics for rotational motion, the external torques are going to be equal to zero. And the final thing to make note of for torque is the direction for it. So for rotational motion, it's kind of tough to define directions, to, to find um, uh, what direction you're going, because you're going around in a circle. So the typical way we define it is, is in terms of uh, thinking about a clock. So we know a clock kind of goes clockwise. So if your torque is rotating you around clockwise, then your torque by convention is considered to be negative. And then if your torque is going the opposite direction that a clock goes, so if you're going counterclockwise, that's when we consider that the torque would be considered positive. So these are all the tools we need to understand and study statics, especially in terms of torque. So a concept that comes up when we're talking about statics is also that systems that are in statics, uh, systems that are stable, uh, they're, kind, they're kind of in equilibrium. And when a system is in equilibrium, there's basically three kinds of equilibriums that you can have. So if a system is in motion, there's three kinds of ways it can be stable. Uh, it can be in equilibrium. It can have a stable equilibrium. So in a stable equilibrium, when you move a particle out of its uh, position, it'll move back to that original position, to that equilibrium position. So we have a stable equilibrium. So that's kind of like a little bowl uh, that's kind of concave. And I can imagine this little ball inside of this bowl. So if I were to take this ball and I move it out of its uh, nice stable equilibrium point, 
if I move it up and then I let go of the ball, the ball is going to go right back down. It's going to roll back down to the place where it was stable before. And that works uh, for push, pushing it up on the other side too. If I roll the ball up, let go of, go of it, uh, it's going to roll right back down to where it will, uh, started from, where it was initially. So this would be a stable equilibrium. When you move your uh, point, and you move your object, and it goes right back to where it was before. That's a stable equilibrium point. So another kind of equilibrium point, another kind of static stability point, is called an unstable equilibrium. So with the unstable equilibrium, your point might, might, might reach a point and, and it might stay there, but if you move it just a little bit, it's gonna, it's gonna go flying. So that would be like a bowl that's uh, kind of upside down. So I can put my ball on top of this bowl, and as long as it's sitting right there on the very top, it's not gonna move. But if I push it just a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, it's unstable. It's not gonna return to the place where it was. It's just gonna keep right on going and fly right down the edge of the bowl. That would be what we call an unstable equilibrium point. So it's not gonna stay where you put it. It's, and it's not gonna go back to where you put it if you displace it or move it at all. Finally, we also have a third type of equilibrium point called a neutral equilibrium. And the neutral equilibrium point is kind of exactly what it sounds like it's going to be completely neutral. If I take a flat line, this can represent a neutral equi equilibrium point. So I put a ball down, and this ball, if I move it, if I move this ball over to the left, or if I move it over to the right, it's actually not going to roll back to where it was. It's just going to stay put at its new position, new position on the left or new position on the right. This would be the example of a neutral equilibrium point. So we need to keep these in mind as we're working with statics. These are the ways that you can have a, a position um, a system in, in kind of equilibrium so that it stays still, so that the torques can, can kind of. So one of the most useful reasons that we uh, kind of study statics is that they're very, very useful and very applicable inside of the human body. So if you're going to go into physical therapy or some kind of healthcare industry, you're going to need to understand statics in terms of how they control muscles and ligaments and bones. These all require various torques and various static motions to understand. We can understand them in terms of a concept, uh, the being a concept of something called a simple machine. And basically with a simple machine, it's, it's a way to augment the force by tweaking the distance over which that force is applied. And when we model the human body uh, as kind of a simple machine, we can define uh, how good the body is working with something called mechanical advantage, which describes how good your muscles are working, uh, how efficient they are in terms of an output force, so some kind of force that you get out of your muscle, divided by the input force, whatever you force you're putting into that muscle. So we can understand this in terms of an arm, and this is my horribly, horribly drawn picture of somebody's arm. And we've got this little uh, pivot point, this little joint, that's gonna be your elbow, very, very roughly. And then we have two muscles inside of your upper arm that kind of control how this arm works. We have the tricep. And the tricep is going to be a flexor, or um, uh, is gonna be an ex extensor. So this is how you kind of loosen your arm up, how you, how you, how you release it. And then we also have this muscle up, up, up over here, uh, that's gonna be the bicep. The bicep is gonna be your flexor. So that's how you kinda, kind of uh, apply a force to, to bring your arm up. So the forces that we're applying with these muscles are gonna act, act in two different directions. I'm gonna have the extensor, the, the tricep is how I kind of extend my arm. That force is gonna kind of, kind of be acting to pull my arm down. So that's gonna be the force of my extensor, the force of my tricep, we'll call it FT. Then I also have my bicep. My bicep is how I pull my arm up, how I kind of flex, how I show off how muscular I am, and that it's going to be an upward force. Okay, so that's pulling my arm upwards. So that's the force of my bicep. And I can figure out what kind of torque I'm applying uh, when I use my bicep or when I use my tricep, as long as I know how far it is from my elbow joint out to, say, my bicep, because right now 
if we look at this picture, I'm kind of flexing, kind of pulling my arm up. Um, my uh, tricep would be completely relaxed in this position, and my bicep is the only one doing some work. Uh, so I would have some force that, that's occurring at some radius. We'll call this radius of the bicep. Uh, so I can have a torque on my bicep. My bicep is executing a torque in my body. The torque of that bicep is going to be R of the bicep times F of the bicep. And we're going to act in very, very simple terms and assume that my radius and my force uh, of my bicep are perpendicular. So that's going to be sine of the angle between the two, which is 90. Uh, and that, when you take sine of 90, just goes to 1. So the torque on my bicep is going to be equal to R of the bicep times F of the bicep. Okay, and this is acting upwards. So if I look at the direction that my arm's gonna rotate around my pivot point, my arm's gonna kind of rotate around like this. That would be kind of the counterclockwise direction. So this torque of my bicep is gonna be, uh, gonna be positive. And my arm actually has some mass to it as well. So my arm is going to exert a torque uh, on, around my elbow, around this pivot point. So I can imagine that my arm has some, um, some weight to it. So that weight is going to act, and we'll treat it as though it's acting at the center mass of the arm, and that weight's going to act to pull this down. So when I'm flexing uh, my bicep, I'm pulling that bicep, um, I'm pulling that arm against the weight of gravity, so the weight of my arm. That's going to be the force of the arm that I'm acting. So that's going to be the mass of my arm um, times the acceleration due to gravity, how, fat, how much gravity is pulling my arm down. Uh, so this torque of my arm, we'll call it T uh, tau A, is going to be acting at some distance. We'll call this the radius of my arm. So the distance from my elbow to the center of mass of my arm, we'll call that RA. And it's going to be equal to the times, uh, the torque is going to be equal to RA times the weight of my arm, times the force that my arm is kind of being pulled down with, this W arm. Okay, and this torque, if I look at it, is acting to rotate my arm kind of in this direction, kind of the clockwise direction. So since it's going clockwise, that's going to be negative. And where statics comes into play is when I imagine what happens when this is completely static. So once I'm, when I'm flexing my bicep, I'm kind of holding my arm stationary. I am static. So if I'm static, then the total torque that I have, the net torque in statics, has to be equal to zero. So in this case, in this kind of rough concept example, uh, I can add up my torques and know that they have to be equal to zero. So the torque of my bicep plus the torque of my arm have to add up to give me zero. So I can plug in my relationships that I found, RB times FB uh, and RA times uh, WA, and I get RB times FB for the torque of the bicep minus RA times the weight of my arm for the torque of my arm. And this negative sign comes in again because my arm is pulling me down. My arm is gonna rotate clockwise and clockwise torques are negative, whereas my bicep's gonna rotate counterclockwise, keep my arm going, uh, staying up. So that's gonna be a positive torque. And these are gonna be equal to zero. So what I can see is that when I'm flexing, the torque of my bicep, RB times the force of my bicep, the force that uh, I'm applying to keep my arm steady, is equal to RA, how big uh, my arm is, the distance from its pivot point to uh, basically from my elbow to the middle of my arm, times the weight of my arm. So I can see I need bigger bicep, biceps to keep uh, my arm flexed if I have bigger arms. That's how it kind of works in, in the field of statics and in a kind of very rough physical example.